Well, good evening, everybody. It's been a while. I've been watching and taking it all in and seeing how everything is beginning to manifest faster and faster and more and more. If you've been paying attention as much as you can, not taking your eye off the ball, you should be seeing most of the same things. This is, to me, one of the major things that we should understand about right now. Of all the things that are going on politically throughout the world, affecting our own country, when the Supreme Court <clears throat> made the decision that in their opinions it is all right to allow gay same-sex same marriage. I believe that was a very, very, very serious thing that it said to our Heavenly Father. Now we have seen the struggle, and this is the one they have chosen to put in front of us as the very first real publicized battleground of good and evil. The lady clerk cited her belief in the words given to us by our father and she said that she would obey his words and that she would not go against his words that she in her words I believe she said there was a a higher court a higher authority than man's court and man's authority something to that that nature. Maybe I didn't get her words exactly right. But it was a decision for her regarding heaven and hell. And in this, there's more than one, but in this article here, it is a heaven or hell decision. Now, I want to warn all people that she has touched on a very heavy subject in those simple words there a heaven and hell decision it is written that these acts between two people of same sex which we call homosexuality Our Lord finds that type of conduct detestable. Now, what do people not understand? What does not compute with them about the definition of the word detestable? It means he cannot stand those kind of actions, that, that type of dirty sin he finds filthy. And because of it, if all time stopped right now and he appeared right now, all those, and we are speaking only on that one sin right now, that one subject of this type of sin, this homosexual activity, he would have to judge all those people engaging in that based upon what he has already tried to tell, that he finds this detestable. In doing so, I humbly say to all that the robes that you would have on would not be clean. They would be filthy. And the sin that you engaged upon, which you thought was nothing wrong with it, 
would be written in the book that he would open and it would be upon the page. And if there are sin upon the page that are not forgiven, such as this type of detestable conduct, he would have to pass judgment and sentencing upon all those people that do that thing. And there is no go stand in the corner for an hour and come back and then you may enter through my gates into my kingdom. It is, you will enter the kingdom or you will not enter the kingdom. There is no place for you to go if you do not enter the kingdom besides you will enter hell. It will be eternal separation from God and any friends, any loved ones, relatives that have passed on, that have entered through those gates into his kingdom. You will not be allowed. Do you understand what I'm saying, how serious and dire this is? Well, what has happened to this woman is she has been threatened to come around and start giving these people these marriage licenses with the threat of financial punishment or jail, and everybody should know by now, they have placed her in jail because she has stood firm, she has stood tall, she has stood for God, she has stood with God, and you can rest assured, he is smiling upon that woman, he is with that woman, even though she is behind bars. This picture representing the people outside waving that flag and they are happy that this lady is in jail for standing with God upholding his word they say love wins it is not love. Those of these people who are into that type of relationship, same sexes or bisexual, any of that immorality that is not just a man and a woman. It is lust. You have been twisted by the spirit demon of lust. Your whole way of thinking has been twisted to where you don't understand what love really is. You think you do, but you do not. Love would be you understanding them understanding that the first definition of marriage was in the Garden of Eden when God made a woman for Adam and gave her unto him, thereby consecrating the first couple in the world as man and wife and blessing them and instructing them to have union and to start making babies. That is where marriage first began and it was created by the Creator, by the Father in Heaven. And if you really knew what love was, you would love Him enough to believe the words that He has said. And the words he has said, some of them, is you do not engage in same-sex conduct. It's repulsive, it is immoral, and it is unnatural. 
I am by no means just telling you this out of my opinion. I agree also with, with the Father. I understand and I see it. I've never been even remotely attracted to that type of a conduct. So for me to try and understand why they are, uh, well, it's difficult to try and get in minds of the people that do those types of things and, and see what do they see in it because I do not see that they see love in it. They think it is, but it is not by any means. And they have to understand this because, as I said, you do not want your robe to be stained with sin. And if you think there's nothing wrong with what you're doing, you're not going to be asking to be forgiven for it. You're not going to be turning away from that kind of conduct and repenting of it. Can you imagine if you're doing something like this, standing, well, you won't be standing, I, I can assure you that. You will be on your knees in front of the throne of the Most Holy. And in some fashion, he is going to be letting you know what you have done was wrong. Letting you know that you had the opportunity to stop. Letting you know that you had the opportunity to turn away from that sin and repent of it and not do it anymore. To admit to him that what you had done was wrong and you realized it and that you were sorry for it and that you were going to stop doing it and try as hard as you could to never do it again and to ask him to please forgive you and blot it out and find your name still written in the book of life but no sins recorded upon any of the pages of the book because you had been forgiven and turned away and repented when he lets you know all these things that you had opportunity of doing and you did not do it, that is not the time you will be allowed or should think you could have that time to ask to be forgiven. That is time for you to feel your the shame of your wrongdoings that you intentionally kept doing. I mean, can you imagine the flood of emotion as you realize all these things and that you had the time to change, but instead, you kept doing what you were doing. You kept pumping it out there that this was love, love wins, rah, 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 flew the flag. <coughs> was glad that a woman that stood with the Lord stood up for the Lord, ended up in jail persecuted by people of this type that engage in this type of sin. So this truly is representative of good versus evil. And people engaging in sin that think they have won. They have won nothing. They are condemning themselves and they either don't even care that they are or they're too wrapped up in their own little mindset and lifestyle to even realize they've condemned themselves, much less even believe that there will be a judgment and a punishment for their conduct. God wishes no soul to be lost to hell. 
and he gives every opportunity. For oneself to be saved from hell. I promise you, if you will make the effort, he will deliver. If you will pray with everything inside you and mean it, He's going to know if you're meaning it or if you're just lipping it. The thinking that if you just say the words without meaning it, you will escape hell. He will know the difference if you mean it or if you just half-heartedly mean it. If you really mean it and you confess to him and you let him know Father, I am sorry for all the things I've ever done. I've done so many things I never can tell you one by one. And speak and confess every single one. If you'll tell him the ones you can remember and ask him to forgive the ones that you can't even remember, and let him know you're, you're sorry. You don't want to be that way anymore. And ask for forgiveness. You will have forgiveness. If you ask him to save you, bring the Holy Spirit into you so that it can live inside you. It can begin to change you from the inside. Change your heart coexist inside of you with the very fabric of your being, your soul. He will give that to you. You will begin to be closer. And the more you draw closer to God, the farther away you'll get from sin. As you're an imperfect being, you will never be perfect. So you will not be able to stop sinning completely. That is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is the severity of the type of sin and the, the gap between the time of each sin will, be, will begin to improve and be farther and farther apart and less and less and less. And that is because you're consciously making the effort to, to not do those things and to follow God and to follow His teachings. And it will help you to realize at the very point of when you've done something wrong, you will immediately know it. There'll be no, no little going stupid on yourself. And, Oops, I didn't know it. And then think about it three days later. No. The Holy Spirit will help to convict you. And maybe you don't like feeling, feeling guilty, but it will give you that feeling. It, it will convict you, and that's a good thing. To feel guilty about your wrong is understanding that you've done wrong. And that leads to you being sorry that you've done wrong, which will lead you to pray and say you're sorry, and ask to be forgiven. You see what I'm trying to tell you? And these are all good things. Now on the flip side of that coin, when you do this, when you want to change, and you do the things I just said, evil is not going to leave you alone. If anything, those evil spirits are going to come even harder on you and try to get you even harder than they did before. Because you have went farther away from them and they want you back. 
They want you to be sinning all the time again. So the battle will not stop. The battle never stops. They are tormentors and tempters. So this is the forefront of a major battle, whether you realize it or not, that has erupted on the scene right in front of you on your television, in your newspaper. We should all take this lady's example and emulate it. Do not be part of the silent majority. Do not agree and think that it's okay to mind your own business. It's none of my business how these people live their lives. It's their choice how they live their lives. Do not be a, a chicken shit to speak out against it. Do not cop out and use the excuse, oh, I can't say anything. i got a family to support. If I say something against it on my social media, or to any co-workers at work, I could get in trouble and get fired, and then I wouldn't be able to be, pay the bills and buy the groceries. Don't use that as an excuse. Omission is almost just like denial. Omitting your voice by staying silent is almost the same as denial. You cannot stand with someone if you're in the shadows hiding. Do you actually think it's your employer? Does anybody actually think it's their employer? And the paychecks we receive from them for our work that pays our bills where we can live. It is God that allows everything in this world for us. The fact that we even have a job, those of us that have jobs, is only because. He's allowed us to have one. He's allowed there to be employers that can employ us. He wants us to depend on him for everything. So even if something happened and you got sent out the door because you stood with him, he's going to know you stood up for him and stood with him. He's going to smile upon you for doing that, and he's going to take care of you in some way or manner. You have to have the faith, and you have to believe. Evil wins by people saying nothing. Evil wins by people doing nothing. They use the excuse in this court case that she took an oath, and by taking the oath, she is bound to the laws of her state, you know, in her county and such, that she must do this thing, which is a man-made law. That is the underlying message being sent is that man's laws which are allowing this type of sin are above and more important 
than God's laws, which do not allow for this type of sin. Now, all these other court clerks throughout the nation, all these churches and the ministers who perform the marriages in those churches, you're all in trouble. And I mean, you're in big trouble. Because if all of you are giving those marriage licenses out and marrying those couples, don't you think for one second that you will not be charged by our Father because you are engaging willfully you will not use the excuse that you are forced to do it to keep your job or to keep your tax-free status you will not be allowed to use that as an excuse you will be charged in the most high court the heavenly court with just as serious of an offense as if you had been one of the willing participants in the same sex relationship. Because you've put your stamp of approval on it when you issued the marriage license, because you put your stamp of approval on it when you perform the marriage service, you are guilty of applauding, endorsing that type of conduct. And if I were to be in your shoes, in front of the throne, humbled by my Lord for that type of act, I pray for you, brothers and sisters, that are doing that, because it is a very, very, very serious consequence to have to answer for. Don't you understand the time is now? Look at all the things that I've already spoke with you about, about the month of September. Some people don't believe in the Shemitah or the Jubilee year. Some people are confused on it. And they say, well, you know, I looked in the Bible and it mainly has to do with Israel, Israelites and Israel. Well, yeah. It was handed down to Moses, right? Right? Okay. And salvation and forgiveness and stuff were initially gifted upon the Israelites who gave it out, you know. The apostles and stuff taught it and gave it out to everybody else, right? And then it was decided that the Gentiles sought it also. And so they said, God said okay, and that Gentiles were allowed to receive the same same thing. So it was originally given back then to the Israelites in Israel, but it also encompassed all the people of the world. You know? I don't know if you've seen the big enough picture or not, but you have to take it seriously because it is a real thing and we are in it and it is cyclical. Like I said, you've got Obama, you've got the Pope meeting in September, you've got Congress and the Pope meeting in September, you've got the Pope going to perform a service in September, you've got the, what, the big, big meeting with the Pope and the uh, UN meeting. And then you have even something crazy, you know. You've got um, the Kabbalistic witch, Madonna, touring. And she will be making a performance, um, oh, September the 12th, it says here. And 
of all the themes that you could have, the theme behind a concert, the underlying message behind it, your theme, can you, can you actually believe that somebody would, would decide that the desecration of the bride and the arrival of fallen angels would be your theme? Now, I want you to really think about that. The bride, well, to, you know, a simple-minded person will probably say, oh, well, that means the bride, a man and a wife. You know, It's like raping the woman or something, desecrating her. Well, huh. what would a simple-minded person think about arrival of fallen angels then? If you're going to try and cop out and say that's what the desecration of the bride means. To me, the bride is is the bride and the bridegroom for the wedding. The followers of, of God, you know, the, 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 the church, the real followers, we're the bride. So to me, that's what that means. The real followers of God, and the desecration of them. And then the arrival of fallen angels. Like, like you've been waiting for someone to arrive who was on their way. You've been waiting on them to get here. And finally, they got here. And then they're going to desecrate the bride, which would be us followers of God. Us, us who love Yeshua, you know. And then you see some of these crazy names of her songs and Devil's Pray, Devil Pray, Ghost Town, Illuminati, Holy Water, Messiah, and then of course Rebel Heart. Rebel. Lucifer was a rebel. So Like I say, that's in September also, and you're still going with the Jade Helm. Now, the Jade Helm is supposed to end on the 15th, and I'm going to put a little two cents in about that. You had a lot of guys on YouTube, some of the big studs, <coughs> and, you know, <clears throat> they showed you the trains with the military hardware rolling down the line, trucking out somewhere. They showed you the convoys on the highways and stuff. You know, no problem with that. You hear the write-ups from a couple other guys about going to round up people, you know, this, that, and the other. Now, I tried to make it plain and simple and clear, and I'm standing by it. Not at this time. They're not going to do that right now. I tried to explain it. This is about artificial intelligence. That's why, remember I showed a totally different document than most of them were showing, and I explained it and I said, that's even before I watched that lady on John Wells' show talk about it. I said somehow it reminded me of Minority Report. Well, that's what I meant, because they, they used the computer, a predictive program, to predict who was going to do what before who did whatever they were going to do, and then they went and got them before they did it, and that's pre-crime unit. Well, that, I showed you the document, and it, it was all about artificial intelligence. You're going to be starting to make decisions for the fighting forces. And, and that's exactly what Jade Helm is right now. They're playing around outside with it, and they're working all the bugs out of it with the decision-making process of the AI.
So they're not coming to round nobody up right now. They're going to do that later on. But they're not going to do it now. So some of these guys took up collections, you know, on GoFundMe, went out and bought these nice expensive drones so they could fly them around and get pictures and crap. And they didn't come back and get pictures of nothing. They went and set up shop and everything. Came back flat-footed with zilch. But yet they copped off about 4000 bucks from a GoFundMe fund to go buy these little toys just so they could try and be the only hot shot in town that had a drone to fly around and catch some pictures from altitude. Well, sometimes you can't get close enough with your drone because it's called a, uh, what, what do they call that now? Oh, restricted airspace. Yeah, you can't just fly a drone anywhere you want to. Yeah, people that copped off money didn't think about that and sent their money in. But anyway, that's the bottom line is some people went out and done that kind of junk. And it didn't do them any good. It was just a big hoopla, you know, letting people know he was going to do that. But the Jade Helm is going to end this month, supposedly also in September. And you have seen, also, it began before September and is continuing into September since since I'm talking about Shemitah and Jubilee year right on at this moment, you have seen the stock market really starting to bomb. All right? Um, I can't remember exactly, but I think the, the high range of the stock market, it reached its all-time high. It was like 18,200, wasn't it? Right about 18,000. I want to say 18,300. Maybe it wasn't 18,300. Well, we'll just say 18.2. Now, last I checked, it's hovering around 16,000. So, can you do some math there? It's lost 2,200 points. So, what would that be? Can you divide 18.2 into 16,000? It's lost over 10%. 10% loss is a big hit, and that's just the beginning. Well, remember, the biggest, the biggest one-day loss in its history was 777 points. Final bell, ding, 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 ding. You know, it's all over, trading's done. 777 points down. And we, and we already saw it just go plumb wild days ago. And it went down like 1,089 points at one point. Hello? The biggest single day trading loss, 777, and you just watched it a few days ago plop down to 1,089 while it was still trading. It came back up and didn't end up 1,089 down, but you watched it zag down that far. The Lord is not pleased with the conduct that we have shown. He's given us every chance there is. You've got to stand up. You got to be vocal. It's not what you think. It's what you do also. What are you doing? You know, actions speak a lot louder than words. Are you talking to anybody? Are you doing any action? Are you trying to talk to anyone that's engaging in this kind of homosexual conduct? 
Maybe you don't know anyone directly. Maybe you know a friend of yours that knows someone who's doing it. Maybe you know a friend of yours who knows a friend of theirs who knows somebody that's doing it. And maybe through this relay of friends or something, you can get something to these people to try and change them. Because we're, if we're not doing anything for these people to try and stop them from continuing in their evil ways, We're saying it's okay for them to go to hell. If we just mind our own business and don't say or do anything for them, we're just saying, okay, you made the decision to go to hell, so it's fine with us. And you can't do that. you got to change your mindset, folks. You ain't got a whole lot of time left. The shit's running downhill faster and faster, and it's building up. The, 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 the shit ball is getting bigger and bigger and bigger as it comes down the hill, and it's rolling faster and faster and faster. Now, what about this French man that gave the speech with Carrie? and said, in 500 days, we will reach a climate abyss. Something to that nature. What in the world did that guy mean? You know, there's been a lot of stuff said about his comment there. And I've tried to think, you know, what does this guy know something, you know, is... What's he talking about? You know, 500 days. How could they have something down to the exact day? If, you know, as far as having to do with the climate. <clears throat> My thinking may have changed a little bit on that matter. I'm leaning towards what this man is actually meaning. Is that they wanted legislation passed? about this subject that would give them the international legality of the entire planet to do these regulations and these controls to further their clamping down on humanity with the guise of climate chaos, climate change. I'm really thinking that's that's more or less ex exactly what he actually meant. Now, a lot of people might have took it that there was an event going to happen in 500 days, but after I really thought, really thought hard about it, I think he was meaning we want to get this stuff passed before 500 days. And the Pope, you know, he's going to speak about climate change. Obama always says, hey, it's a sense of urgency. You know, we're urgency. They want these, they want this passed. They've got it all packaged up and ready to go. And they want it passed soon. And I, I think it, I think if I remember right, they're trying to hammer this stuff through by, the, by December, the end of the year. I think they'd rather have it sooner than that. And did you ever think Mount McKinley would be renamed Mount Denali? Is that the name that I remember? Denali? Did you ever think that you would live in your lifetime to where a president would all of a sudden, out of the clear blue, Rename a mountain? Every time I think this dickhead has, you know, 
pulled the rabbit out of a hat and sunk to the lowest depths of the scum that he is, I always find myself realizing that he has not sunk to the lowest, that he can always go lower, that he can always pull another, another crappy thing. Well, there was never even any mention beforehand or discussion. Hey, he's thinking about changing Mount Everest into Mount Denali. Shoot, we never even got a sniff about that. We have a problem. We have so many problems here. We have these these supposed shootings, and we're getting supposedly revenge killings on police. We're getting this, that, and the other shooting. Eh, we want to take your guns away, blah, blah, blah. And I thought long and hard about that. There is no way they'll take your guns away. You want to know why? There's too many of you that's got them. Right? There's too many of us that's got them. They don't have enough manpower to come around and get in everybody's guns. If you think like a scumbag, instead of coming and get your gun, they just kill the people that's got the guns. You know, didn't he say he's real good at killing people? He's the drone master? Ain't that what the Pharaoh said? Yeah, they could just send out a bunch of drones and identify which homes or where's the guns at and stuff. They know where you work and everything. If they want to get you there. You got your cell phone on you. Nobody, nobody seems to be able to keep that phone out of their hand. Take it everywhere they go. They can't leave it in the car. They go into a store. They're walking around with it glued to their ear. Or sitting there rolling their thumbs over it. Sending texts and junk. It's ringing while... Somebody's calling somebody and it's ringing while you're in line cashing out somewhere. Somebody's driving down the road. You can see they're, see they're using it while they're going down the road. So they know it would be easier to kill you, to stop you from using your gun, than actually come and try to take your gun. You know, think about it. And the same thing is with Jade Helm. Yeah, they're probably going to round some people up later on down the line using that program, that AI. But hey, maybe the AI says, we're not going to have that many people to round up like you guys originally thought before I came fully aware and online. We're just going to drone them. And they'll just send out the drones. And they'll kill them. They'll kill us. You know, you could probably make up something stupid and pump it out in the media that hackers or some crap hacked into the system and took control of all the drones and they launched a terrorist attack with them that killed blah, 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 you know, X amount of thousands or millions or whatnot of people. These evil scum know no depths. They have no empathy. They have no regret. They could blow the Hoover Dam. They could blow a nuclear you know, a reactor a facility. In their twisted, evil minds, the ends justify the means. The means justify the end. You get it? 
whatever method they have to do or use to accomplish getting to the end goal, that's okay with them. It doesn't matter. They're just going to lie, 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 lie. Because the doting public is so eager to be lied to, they will believe just about anything. And that's really sad. It really is. I'm telling you, it's time to make a choice. There ain't no putting it off anymore. If you think you already have, you better reaffirm it now. Because if you think you can sit in the shadows and let all this stuff keep going, you're going to have to do something besides staying in the shadows. Choose ye now whom you will serve. Pick a side. Our Heavenly Father, or the other one, the liar, the evil one, the son of perdition. It's time. I mean, it's really time. It's time to put your stamp, your footprint, on which side you're on. Don't be ashamed or embarrassed to let your friends, even strangers, know. When you go out to eat, don't be ashamed. Don't think I don't want to draw attention to the table. Have everybody looking over here. We'll look funny. Don't be ashamed to bow your head and pray before you eat and thank the Father for the gift of the food that you're getting ready to enjoy. Never be ashamed of Yeshua. Never, ever be ashamed of our Lord. He's not ashamed of you. Think of a big box with a smaller box inside of it and a smaller one inside the smaller one. A series of boxes, one inside the other, with the largest box being the big picture of time. We've worked our way from the smallest box all the way out we're inside the next to last box. Picture the outside box is the end of time. It encompasses all the other ages, all the other times, all those years. So even though you're still in, the next to largest box of time. Looking at the big box, you can see that the time that you have remaining isn't that much compared to the outer box of the end of time. You see what I mean? Great changes are coming, not only for us, for the whole world. Somebody out there I know is going to nitpick me and play devil's advocate and say, oh, nothing's going to happen tomorrow or the week after or 
Well, how much time would you have if you had one year compared to the length of 10,000 years? One year ain't much time comparing it to 10,000, is it? And that's my point. In the big picture of time that's been running, we're almost out of time as time as we know it. As the way life is as we know it. And I've been thinking about the mark of the beast also. While I just now have it on, just popped up on me, I want to speak on that too. <clears throat> Some thought of the matter has been, could it possibly be a chip? And I thought possibly, yeah, maybe it would be a chip. But the more I think about it, the more I wonder if it's maybe not a chip in the sense of something smaller than a grain of rice chip, you know, that kind of thing. Because we are told that this mark, you will take it in your forehead or your right hand. Now I kind of think, as far as that mark goes, that there's going to be a way that you can actually see it, see that a person has taken it, where there will be something noticeable upon a forehead or upon the right hand. So I'm thinking if they inject this thing underneath your skin, and it's smaller than a grain of rice, it may not be really noticeable, unless it left some kind of a, you know, some kind of like a red bump where you took the injection, or maybe a little tiny bump hump where you, know, you could barely see something was under the skin. But if he was walking around as a crowd jump, people were passing by at a normal walking pace, Maybe you wouldn't be able to see who had it and who didn't. So it got me to thinking maybe we're still around when this mark comes. Maybe that's part of the separation of the wheat and the tear. Because it's going to be voluntary. They can't force you to take it. They can threaten you. They can torture you. But they can't make you take it. You've got to agree to it. And you will not be fooled into taking it. You will full-heartedly know that what you are doing is taking that mark of the beast. You will know. You will not be fooled into doing it. That being said, I'm leaning towards it's going to be something more noticeable upon your forehead and on your hand. That way you can be, it can be seen out in public that Joe Blow has something on his forehead or his hand. Billy Bob don't have nothing on his forehead or his hand. So that you'll be able to tell one guy has got it and one guy doesn't. And that leads me to think it's going to be more of a, more of a nano technology in the form of I think possibly I'm going to be leaning towards the tattoo type of a deal and I think the little nanos will will be able to be absorbed through the forehead or the hand into the system your body system they will go, the nanos will, into your DNA. And then you will be supposedly changed 
where you will be more resistant to illnesses and you won't get sick and maybe your intelligence will hike up, you know, a hundred points where you'll be a lot smarter and it'll hype you up to where you're stronger, faster, what have you. But I just think it's it's more something that you'll be able to see. And that's why I lean towards, I'm now leaning towards, I think it's going to be some type of a nanotechnology tattoo. And the reason, once you take it, you know what it is. And you've taken it. You can never get rid of it. Maybe you could go to a tattoo artist and have the outside taken off, but you can never get rid of it because it's already changed your genetics. It's already changed your DNA that God gave you when he created you. That is the part you can never go back from because you agreed to become part of the son of perdition's new genome to be one of his altered creations. He can't create anything. He just alters what is created. He works with something that's already existent and changes it to be what his version of it is. So folks, please, 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 understand how critical this is. This is not small potatoes. This is not something to sniff at and move on and say it's old news. This is not something to say that does not concern me. This guy here, this is just mind blowing, isn't it? We're already in the Shemitah, and we're already approaching a Jubilee year. But, but this guy is given the, you know, given the okay, like. We're not in nothing until I give an okay on it. I will. He's going to allow all the priests to forgive abortion during a holy year. During the holy year, well, there's you know, there's some priests and stuff that said that they already does that throughout the year and jump. But for, to even utter the words that I will allow all priests to forgive abortion during a holy year. I never heard him say that we were in a, ju in a jubilee year coming up on one. Until it started being talked about. And then, remember I, I think I put it up in a, in a video. Pope declares blah, blah, blah to be year of Jubilee. He doesn't declare anything. Those years were set in stone before this guy, you know? Oh, he doesn't declare anything. And I am not against any of you Catholics out there, okay? That's not my point. And I'm going to say it again. I'm going to implore you to look inside yourself and think about what I have said. Think about my words that is rolling off my tongue. Why do you need to go to a confessional room Shut the door, sit.
sit down, confess your sin to a man who then absolves you of it and tells you you are forgiven and then gives you certain things which are easy things to do as a form of penance for the things which you have confessed to him. Why are you doing that? Why are you not going directly to the Father yourself and confessing unto him, not to this man in a little room, Why are you not? Why are you going to a middleman when you can go directly to the Father? It makes no sense to me. You can confess your sins to the Father and speak directly to Him and confess everything to Him that you are doing in the confessional booth to this man priest. You can repent of your sin and you are not that stupid. You can think of things that you can do as penance yourself. That is much more of a penance than saying 15 Our Fathers and 20 Hail Marys. Are you getting my point? Why do you engage in this type of a ritual when it is unnecessary and you don't have to? God wants you to pray to Him. When the apostles said, Hey, Jesus, how do we pray? And He said, This is how you pray. And He said to our Father. He didn't tell them guys, Okay, once I'm gone, there's going to be a church set up and, and you go into the church you find the priest, you go into a little room, you tell him all your stuff, and then he's going to forgive you on my behalf. He didn't say that. So if Yeshua never taught that, why are you doing what this ritualistic church tells you to engage in? God wants you to live in the truth and the light in his way. In his teachings, not by these man made ritualistic teachings of this large body called the Catholic Church. You don't need to go to a confessional. You need to get on your knees in your own home. That is your confessional. Anywhere you want it to be is your confessional. The moment you go into prayer and start praying to the Father, you're in the confessional, just Him and you. You don't need that Catholic priest. And we're going to see what... I just shook the tree pretty good on that one if there's any Catholics out there. I'm sure I'll get a backlash off of that. <coughs> Pardon me. If my intention is not hating on you, my intention is to try and wake you up. This guy has no business being involved in, in, in this facade, this lie of global warming. And the fact that he has interjected himself into the subject is very questionable and it should raise all your red flags. Because it's just showing you what a globalist he actually is and how he is seeking to mold religion and politics together as part of this new world order. And they're going to use part of the control system mechanisms that they're going to use is all this legislation now that they say they imminently need to pass in order to save the world. Grow a brain, folks. 
find one somewhere. Understand, this is going to hammer the United States for sure, because if the targets they've announced is what they truly are going to put in place, it's going to hammer the U.S. But, you know, you got other countries like China and India that say, hey, we're not screwing up our economy. You know, well, of course, the economies are going to really be taking a dump here pretty soon, even more than, more than they are. But we're looking, you know, we're thinking in the future, if we have that long of a future, China and India is not going to dump on themselves. They're not going to dump 30% emissions and screw things up over there. So how in the world would you be helping this so-called climate change throughout the world if, if these two gigantic nations are not even going to do anything that's going to make a difference? How is us doing something going to make that big of a difference? And the answer is, it's not going to. So if you can add 2 plus 2 and come up with 4, you should be able to understand that it's not going to make a difference. So if it's not going to make a difference, then they only want these measures in place as control. As in dictatorial control. You know, the new to be in a new world order, you have to be able to control things, right? That's total control of all countries and all people. Total governance control. Why do you think it's it's you can't let this nation and that nation go bankrupt? You can't do it. If you have total control in a new world order, you can't have nations going bankrupt. That's why they're not allowing it to happen. You wouldn't have a new world order of total control if you was allowing nations to go bankrupt. You've just recently heard President Obama you know, he gets on TV and he's talking about, um, what, Puerto Rico? I think it was Puerto Rico. How they should be allowed to use the bankruptcy courts and go bankrupt. And then you have little old Marco Rubio interjecting himself into the conversation, saying, oh, no, we can't do that. I'm against letting them go bankrupt. Right, right, right. You see the good cop, bad cop, talking about the bankrupt stuff. You can't let them go bankrupt. They're not going to let them go bankrupt. They didn't let Greek, Greece go bankrupt, did they? Hey, how about that guy? Yeah, he gets elected down there. Hey, I'm one of you guys. I'm going to fight for you. We're not taking no more of this austerity. We're not cutting pensions. We're not raising retirement ages. We're not going to raise your taxes. Uh-uh, we're not going for this crap. I'm going to go over there and tell them the way it is, bud. What happened? He gets elected. He goes over there. He jacks off the Greek people. He comes back with a deal that shits on them. Just like they didn't want to be. And then, what? <clears throat> his parliament, his cabinet, whatever you. Them guys didn't agree with the deal he made. So, what happened to that? Hey, you guys don't want to roll with me on this? Well, I'll just get rid of you and replace you with a bunch of guys that will roll with me on this deal. And he did. And then they roll the whole deal through. And the guy's resigning, right? How's that for a shaft up the keister? Sorry, you Greeks had to deal with that. But that is a bold-faced, kick-you-in-the-balls example of the New World Order is damn well going to do what they're going to do. 
and they don't give a flying crap about people. You better wake up and understand these things. Or you're going to be lost. But this is your major thing right here. This is the straw that I believe broke the camel's back. Because now you're seeing sin being rewarded, sin, being placed above God's law. When you are seeing God's law and those that uphold it, those that believe in it, those that walk with Him, persecuted, ridiculed, and now jailed for exercising Their faith. We're saying, I love you, Father. I will do your will. If you say yes to the Father and you do his will, they're showing you right now that they will punish you for that. That you will either knuckle under and say no to the Father. You will do our will, or we will punish you. So it is time to wake up, folks. Sleepy time's over. Nap time's over. The clock buzzer just went off. It's time for you to dig in. It's time for you to step out. It's time for you to stand up. It's time for that silence to be broken. It's time for your radiance to flow. And it's time for those that love the Lord to shine upon everybody else that needs to know Him. It's time to find the lost and bring them back into the fold before the critical point comes. Think about what I've said, everything I've said, all the subjects I've touched on. Don't blow one bit of it off because it all concerns you. You, the individual, us as a whole. I can only speak words of wisdom to you. I can't force you to do anything. God's words can only guide you and teach you and hopefully bring you into his kingdom. But he cannot even force you to love him and abide by his teachings. It's all up to you. Seek him and you will find him. Pray to him and he will hear you. I'll speak to everybody again real soon. Yeah, maybe a couple days. I don't know, maybe tomorrow. I covered quite a bit of territory after a layoff. But you'll hear from me again. You always do. Stay safe and stand up for the Most High. Stand up for your Father in Heaven. Stand against the evil.